Well, good morning. I want to welcome you again. Uh, my name is Joel. I am uh, the pastor of this church, and it's always great to uh, see others come and uh, take a part, uh, a part of their day on the weekend and uh, spend it with us, and hopefully learning about God, and the, but also taking the next step of saying, okay, what does it start to look like in the midst of my life? And so if you've been with us through the summer, or you've only joined a couple of times, we've been working on a series that has been focused upon searching for faith, where we've asked the question of, what does faith in God begin uh, to look like? Uh, we have two more weeks, then we're going to wrap it up. Um, so in September, on September the 9th, we're starting a new series, a three-week series, that is going to be looking at what is the focus of our church? If, if our desire is to lead people to Jesus, regardless of, of where you are in your walk of life, to take that next step to get closer to Him, what does our focus begin to look like? And so we're going to talk about Three words. Three words of focus, one word every week. You're probably quicker learners than me, but I need one word a week. And it's going to be commit, grow, and go. Commit, grow, and go. So hopefully by the end of September, we'll have a better understanding as to how those three words, commit, grow, and go, impact our life so that we can be focused upon seeing more and more people allow Jesus to become a part of, of their life. So hope you'll join us. Um, if you have friends, invite them to come. Perhaps sometimes they wonder, you know, what is your church all about? Here's a great opportunity um, for a live look in to see what it is we're about. But this summer, we've been focusing on this question of searching for faith and understanding that faith, as I understand it, is more than simply what you believe. It's more than simply what you know. It's more than simply the number of Bible verses you may or may not have memorized, but rather... How is it impacting my life? How is it making a difference in my life? So that I don't go through life simply believing in God, but rather claiming that incredible promise where Jesus says, I will give you a life worth living. I will give you this abundant life. And so we've been unpacking that every week and looking at how can we take a next step? How can we practically be involved in living out our faith. And, and last week was, was kind of one of those uh, aha moments for me because I spoke on the Sunday, if you were here, you remember, I spoke on the Sunday about one of the ways we experience faith is when we live it out. It is when we take these steps of faith and understand that Christianity is not a spectator sport, right? It's not a, I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna watch what God is going to do, but we see time and time again in the Bible, God inviting us into partnership and saying, hey, listen, I wanna impact people's lives, I wanna impact the community, who's gonna come with me and begin to do it? And one of the takeaways is the fact that when we step out, when we get into the game, we not only see the impact it has on others, but we see the impact it has in our life as well. And so I spoke about that on Sunday, and then I had the opportunity on Monday to Friday to be a part of our sports camp here this past week. And it was amazing to see there's 29 wildly enthusiastic with tons of energy kids and about 13 staff and volunteers from our church just trying to keep up, right? These kids would not be deterred. I mean, if you remember Tuesday, Wednesday, a little bit of rain came down. These kids were just at it, and it was so exciting to sit and to watch and to be a part of seeing these kids and seeing the impact it was having on their life, not only in terms of sports, but also in having intentional conversations with them about what does, what does God mean to them. And so that was really cool to, to see people with gifts and abilities use them to serve God and to serve these great kids in our community. But then there was a flip side. Because at the end of every day, the leaders would come and we would share, you know, what were the highlights or what were some of the challenges? And at the end of the day, almost every day, at least a couple of times, one of the leaders would say, wow, this has really impacted me. I, I, I have really seen my faith become more alive in this day. And so I want to continue to encourage all of you to always be asking yourself the question, what is my next step? What is the next opportunity that God is maybe putting before me? Sometimes it may be unconventional, but we can serve God in a variety of ways. And so will we step out and do that? And that's what, for me, has been like a summary this whole summer, is looking for opportunities for us to make a difference. Looking for opportunities, 
for our faith to become more and more real. And so what we've wanted to be doing is not just simply look at the Bible, because there's great examples of individuals who have lived out their faith, but also to look at our lives as well. Because there are some incredible examples amongst us here today of people who live out their faith in real time. And so I had a chance to sit down with, with two individuals. Uh, they, they didn't want to come to the front. Um, not everyone has the gift of gab like me, I guess. Um, but, but I got a chance to sit down with them in their living room and talk a little bit about how faith becomes real in their life. And as you're about to see, faith doesn't always come at the mountaintop experience, but sometimes in the most difficult places. And so let's, uh, let's take a watch. Good morning. Uh, if you've been with us this summer, we have been uh, doing a series called Faith Lived Out, and we've looked at examples of how do people live out their faith. We've been looking at examples in the Bible, but one of the great things is looking at uh, the lives of those around us and people uh, within our own congregation. And so I have the privilege of uh, sitting here uh, with Candace and Ashton in their home and hearing a little bit about uh, their story and their faith journey. So. Candace, uh, can you just share a little bit about how you started coming to the church uh, and how that all took place? Um, so we've been coming, I've been coming to the church for it'll be four years next month. Um, I was at a very low point in my life and I was at work here in Paris and asking my coworkers about if they had any suggestions on churches that they attended and I was pointed in the direction of Karen Cummings and she invited me to come and attend church with her and um, I immediately started going to book club with her on Monday mornings and then she pointed me in direction of the youth leader who then invited me to young adults as well as uh, being a youth leader at the time and then obviously attending on Sundays as well. Um, and then shortly after that, Ashton came back into my life and we started dating and about six months later he started attending the church as well with me. It's always amazing how quickly uh, time flies uh, from four years to uh, today. Uh, one of the great things I get to do as a pastor is be a part of special days and celebrations and you guys had a special day uh, a few months ago. so. Uh, maybe not everyone knows, but what uh, what happened a couple months ago for, for the two of you? On May 27th, we got married. That's one of those special days, and I got the chance to officiate the wedding. And I think in the history of weddings for me, including the time spent in Malawi, that was <laughs> one of the hottest uh, weddings on record. Uh, but we did uh, make it through. So May 27th, you got married. But I remember being with you about a year ago in July, and there was a different conversation that night in this very room. Mm -hmm. And knowing where that conversation was, uh, to be honest, uh, wedding bells was probably the furthest thing from where you're going to be at. Um, Absolutely. Ashton, can you fill in some of the details? <clears throat> yeah, that. Uh... That day that we had you over was the lowest point in mine and Candace's relationship. Um, throughout mine and Candace's relationship, we've had a lot of highs and we've had a lot of lows. The more we've been reflecting and talking about it, our highs are when we have God in the center of our relationship, when we're praying together, when we're attending church, and you know just 
keeping up with our uh, Christian morals and values. That's when we're solid. And when we shy away from the church, shy away from God, start forgetting to pray, we get really low. We were in a very, very bad spot, and it was to the point that we were just going to break up and just call it quits. So lowest point in your relationship to making a commitment to spend the rest of your life together. <clears throat> how did faith, how did, how did prayer, how, how did God come into play from moving you to the lowest point to making a commitment of lifetime to one another? Well, I remember when you asked me at the table, you said, Ashton, are you praying for this relationship? And when I thought about it, no, I wasn't. I had stopped praying for our relationship about a month or two prior to that. And that was a realization for me that if I'm not even praying for my relationship, that means God's not a part of our relationship. That means I'm not giving it 100%. And if I'm not giving it 100%, we are going to fail. So from that point on, me and Candace started making a uh, conscious effort to start praying together more often, spending quality time together, spending quality time together with God as well, uh, individually and as a couple. We started going to church more and yeah, everything just started turning around for us in our lives and quickly too. Very, very quickly and the love of our relationship it flourished back and it just it it hit us like just a ton of bricks and we were to the best point in our life a couple months after that. It's like that low point never even happened. Wow, it's uh it's amazing to see what, what God can do in the midst of some of the difficult and dark places. So now a year has gone by, uh, you're, you're married, you have a great family, um, faith is still a significant part of your family's life. And so how does faith play out on a day to day? Because I think sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking, you know, we go to church and then we live the rest of our lives as we want. But I don't get that's the sense for the two of you. So how does faith play out day to day? here in your household? A lot of it was to stop making uh, making excuses and to make effort in putting him in the center. And like you said, going to church every Sunday, but we weren't even doing that at one point. So it was to really stop making excuses, stop finding reasons not to go, and to make sure we are just making 100% effort in going every Sunday. And the children really enjoy going, so we really don't have any excuse not to and um, making efforts to make sure we're praying together every day and not just between the two of us, but with the kids as well. Um, uh, joining, the, making the kids join in with us at the dinner table, the children say grace. They take turns saying it every, every meal. Um, we borrowed a children's Bible from the church and we started reading a story every day before dinner and then just talking about it and just having conversations with the kids and um, doing that and putting him in the center not only helped us but it also helped the kids and the kids were starting to ask more questions and they were becoming more interested and if we didn't feel that we had the proper answer for them we'd reach out to our Christian friends and they would give us some insight and and that do you have anything else that you can think of? No, that's, that has been a big change for us, just involving the kids more. And um, with involving them more, we're finding that they're starting to ask more questions from us. And that's a good spot to be in, that they want to learn more about God. They want to know more about the Bible. They want to know about all the historical events that have happened. And that's... That's a, that's a big change for us, and that's a big change in the right direction and in the direction that God has been pushing us to from the very beginning. So, Well, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for taking the time. 
I think it's so encouraging and needed to hear uh, people being honest about the struggles, about how God uh, makes a difference in, in all of life. And so I appreciate having you guys uh, at the church, appreciate your family, and uh, thank you again for taking uh, a little bit of your time this evening to, uh, to share with us here this morning. And, and so I, a lot of things we kind of pull out of that conversation, um, a lot of more things we could have been talking about, but just one real quick thing, and then what we'll talk a little bit more about is the idea that God meets you where you're at, right? I think oftentimes it's so important for us to understand that, that, that we don't wash ourselves up, we don't pretty ourselves up, and then present ourselves to God. God wants to meet us wherever we are. And when we allow that to take place, we start to see just some amazing things uh, happening. But the thing I wanted to pull out of this whole conversation, uh, talk about for us here this morning, is that element of prayer. Uh, prayer, I don't know when you hear that word, what that, what that resonates in your mind, because we're all at a different place in terms of life, we're all at a different place in terms of faith. Uh, for some of you here this morning, uh, a prayer is, is, is something that is a huge part of your life. You are, you are an incredible prayer. You, you have these conversations with God. Uh, for, for others, uh, prayer is not something that's even a part of your reality uh, because you've not yet made that, that commitment to God and so you're not having that conversation with God. For others, you may be kind of somewhere in the middle where you, you want to pray, you want to talk more, but it's, but it's a struggle. Sometimes you don't know what to say. You don't know how to say it. Uh, if you're like me, sometimes you, you have great intentions of wanting to start to pray, and then the next thing you know, you're napping on the couch for 15 minutes, right? It's sometimes hard to stay focused. And so what I want to do for our time here this morning is just, is just talk through this reality of what does a conversation with God begin to look like? Because we know that in any relationship, for the relationship to grow, for the relationship to be significant, it's about having a conversation. That, that when you really want to get to know someone, you don't just simply want to have other people tell you about that person. You want to talk to them yourself. And I think that is so true for us when it comes to God. And so regardless of where you are on the spectrum of life and of faith, I hope this is a helpful conversation. And what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to do something a little bit different that, that may make some people a little uncomfortable, so I'm giving you a bit of a heads up. Um, but we're going to kind of workshop it a little bit this morning so that you don't come to church and then simply hear a guy tell you about the importance of prayer and then you walk away and you either say, yeah, I'd like to pray more, but now what does it start to look like? I want us to model it as well this morning. And so we're going to take a little bit of time, short bursts of time, to, 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 to pray together. Um, it can be quiet, it can be out loud, whatever's going to be, whatever's comfortable for you, but a chance for us just to think through what does this start to look like, and what we're going to do is turn to the passage we have. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, it's Matthew chapter 6. If you don't want to turn to the Bible, just take the bulletin that you have, flip it to the back page, and we're going to walk through this a little bit um, so that hopefully you can take home with you so that this can become more a part of your life. So that whether you're someone who prays a lot or doesn't pray at all, there's an opportunity to say, yeah, this can become more for me. So we're looking at a passage in the Bible from Matthew chapter 6. And it's early in Jesus' ministry. And it's a time when Jesus has a lot of people interested in him. So people are gathering. And he sits them down. And he starts to teach them through some important things to not only believe, but also ways that they are to behave. And one of them is teaching his disciples how to pray. And so if you struggle with prayer, first word of encouragement is the people closest to Jesus struggled with prayer. And so if they struggled with prayer, it's okay for us to struggle with prayer as well. And so I want to quickly look at a couple of, of, of do's and a couple of don'ts. We'll start with the don'ts first before the do's. Um, but to look at things of, okay, what, what does prayer start to look like? So that we hopefully have more of a model as we go out of here today. The first don't comes really early on in Jesus' message. In verse chapter 6, when he, uh, verse chapter 5, he says, Don't be like the hypocrites. Right? No one wants to be a hypocrite. Okay, so what does that look like? They love to pray standing in the synagogues, which would be the equivalent of church. So they love to stand at church, or they love to go into the city market and pray out loud so that they can be seen and heard by others. 
Now, I'm assuming 99.9% of you can tick that box right now and say, that's not something I gotta worry about because I really don't wanna come up and pray in front of other people. I'm not gonna go bust a move after this service and go down to Lions Park and start praying out loud. So I'm covered. Well, yes, sort of, but there's a greater principle. You see, why would you pray out loud in front of others? Because if you're doing it for the wrong motives, you want to impress them. You want it to be all about you. Look at me, look at me, look at how wonderful I am. Look at, look at the great big fancy words of prayer that I use that no one understands and knows what the meaning is, but maybe they'll be impressed, right? So the first don't for me would be don't make prayer all about you, all about me. That if you find yourself falling in the trap of constantly praying and, and the prayer is really just you talking about yourself to God, asking for things or telling him how great you are, not a good place to start. Think of any conversation you have with anyone else. If all they ever do is talk to you about them, you walk away thinking, I'm avoiding them in the supermarket, right? Like you just don't want to have that conversation anymore. So first don't is don't make it all about you. Second don't, um, found a little bit further down in verse seven, he says, and when you pray, again, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. One of the other things that would often happen in Jesus' day that I think still happens today is people think that if I just have lots of repetition, if I just say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, that then suddenly this is a wonderful prayer. And this can even be a danger with what, what we have modeled here, referred to as the Our Father, uh, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, whatever it is. We think, well, if I just kind of rip through the Lord's Prayer really quickly, then I'm good to go. What we're about to see in a moment is this is not just about reciting it, it's about a model that Jesus gives to us. So it's a model for us to follow. And so don't keep babbling on and on and on and on. It means that prayer can be short. The, the effectiveness of prayer is not length of time. Right? I think it's important for us to understand that, that it's not about how long you pray. It's not about just saying God's name or Jesus over and over and over and over again right? God knows who he is. You don't have to remind him. Like, have a conversation. And so it's important for us not to focus on ourselves, not to try to impress God um, with what we say. And so what are some of the do's? Real quickly. The first one is to be intentional. And this is found in verse 6. When Jesus says, but when you pray, go into the room and close the door and pray to your Father. For me, I interpret that as be intentional. Now, the Bible also says, you know, you can pray at any place, at any time. You can pray without ceasing. That, and I understand that, but I think there's value in recognizing that at times we want to be intentional about setting aside time for a conversation, about, about sometimes getting beyond just simply having those prayers when they're focused on the immediate circumstance or situation. And so are we taking time um, to be intentional? Jesus says, go and, and find a room. Go, go and find a place that, that you can spend your time in. And so maybe for, for you, it's, it's finding a time in the day. Maybe it's in the morning, maybe it's at lunch, maybe it's in the evening, maybe it's before you go to bed. There's no right or wrong time. Know your personality. Know your schedule. Set aside a time and say, listen, I want to just talk to you, God, about this today. Second thing is to be focused. Right down the bottom there, verse 9, or bottom in my Bible, maybe not in yours, it says, this then is how you should pray. Jesus is going to set up a model for his disciples, a model that is still relevant for us here today. And so, be focused. And for me, there's two things that have radically impacted my conversations with God. Um, this might be worth the price of admission right here, so you can leave after this if you'd like. First one is pray out loud and find a posture that works. Um, pray out loud. This kind of goes back again to you maybe find a room, be away from people. It doesn't have to be loud. Sometimes it can be a mumble, but I find that when I pray out loud, I, I'm thinking it through more. It's, 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 it starts to resonate more with me that it becomes more alive. And so, so maybe if you've never 
prayed out loud. I'm not saying in front of other people, just on your own, just even if it's just a little mumble, just a brum, brum, like just, just mumble to yourself a prayer, but pray out loud. And the second thing is find a posture that works. My, my, my grandma, she used to always pray on her knees. And oftentimes we see people and we think, you must be really devoted if you pray on your knees. It was amazing. I would go past her room and she'd be on her knees praying. At, at, at dinner time when we prayed before grace, she'd get up out of her seat and go down on her knees and pray. Amazing prayer. I can probably count on one hand the number of times I prayed on my knees, right? Because I, I'm, I'm not that flexible. If I get down on my knees, it'll be five more minutes before I get back up again. It is uncomfortable. And what happens is when I start praying on my knees, I start thinking about how uncomfortable this is and how I don't want to be doing this. And then suddenly my mind wraps around and I've just spent five minutes complaining to God about how I had to get on my knees and pray to him. So I don't pray on my knees. I also don't pray lying down. Right? You probably know where this is going. I start lying down and then I have like, you know, eight hours of prayer. Other people would call it sleep, but what, however you want to roll it, right? So I don't lie down. I don't even sit down often when I pray because sitting lies to slouching, which lies to lying, which lies to sleeping, right? So find a posture that works. And so the best posture for me when I pray by myself, surprise, surprise, standing or walking, right? It's like me trying to give a message and not move. I can't not move. I have to be moving, right? So I, I move and I talk and I, I move that direction. And so find what works for you. Try praying out loud and, and try finding a, a posture that works for you. Because then Jesus gives us a model. And for the rest of our time here, I just want to kind of work us through this model a little bit. And what I hope to do um, is I'm just going to talk a little bit about five points that Jesus highlights for prayer. And then talk about what this can look like. And then I'm going to model how I would pray it. Out loud, pacing around for all of you. Real quick. And then I'm going to pause and give you an opportunity, if you want, to just pray focusing on that. You can pray out loud, you can pray quietly, but just uh, about 30 seconds will give you a chance just to focus, to see what does this start to look like for you. Because we're all from different places, it's all going to be different opportunities. And so what does this start to look like? Well, Jesus starts off his prayer by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. For me, that reminds me of four things. The first one is Father, that this is a relationship, Right? That God values relationship, not religion. And so I, I may just talk to him as I would I talk to my own father, right? Like when I address my dad, I don't kind of step into the room and like use like my James Earl Jones voice, right? If, if I had it, I might use it. But, but you just talk normally like you would in anyone else. And focusing on the fact that, that he is a father, the one who loves you, the one who cares for you. The one who willingly sent his son to this world for you and for me. It's the first thing I remember. The second thing I pray about is the hour, right? It's not just my father. It's our father, that we are in this together. Look at how our and us is used throughout this prayer. It's never an I, it's never a me, but it's a fact that we are meant for community. And so one of the things I do is I, I pray about my community here, our community. I pray for our church. I pray for the people in this church. I pray for our staff. I pray for our leaders. I pray for people by name in this congregation. I give thanks for the people who support me and who encourage me. I pray for this church. It's the second thing. When it says, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, that reminds me of two things. The first thing is that God is in heaven. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is in control. He is in control. And sometimes I just need to remind myself of that. And so if there are things that are bothering me, things that I'm starting to get anxious about, I may just hand them back over to him and be reminded that God is in heaven. God is in control. And he is holy, which means he is perfect. He does not make mistakes. And sometimes I have to be reminded that even though I may not understand what is happening to me, 
If God is my Father who loves me and is in control, he does not make mistakes, and so will I trust in him. It's just the first line. Ready to pray a little bit? Well, that's a rousing endorsement. Thank you. Ready for cake? You don't have a chance. You don't have a choice anyways, right? Um, So I'm just going to pray real quickly, and then when I say amen, it gives you a chance just to to focus on these four things. God the Father, our community here at the church, that he is in control, and that he can be trusted. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the one who loves me, that you are the one who cares for me, that you are a God that is not distant, but you are the Father who meets me where I am, in my success, in my weaknesses, in my mistakes. I thank you, Father, that for this church, for the people that are here today, for the people that encourage me and support me, I thank, I thank you for our staff. I think of Stephanie with, with our kids and with Jonathan with the youth and Chuck and Shirley with music, and Elaine who takes care of the entire building, for Julie who does all the administration. I thank you for them. I thank you, Jesus, that in the midst of my uncertainties, of, of even thinking about this building, of what the decision's going to be, that you are in control and that you will lead us in the right direction. And so in the midst of my uncertainties and my doubts, um, Jesus, help me to continue to trust in me. Amen. I'll give you 30 seconds. Say what's on your heart to God. Amen. And so the second line we come to is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, For me, I I wrote four things down, I'll narrow it down to three, but I, I think of what is God's will in my life? What is God's will for this community in which we live? And what is God's will for the world? And so I begin to think through, okay, what is God wanting in my life? What is God wanting for this community? We see over and over again that God is for our communities. And so are we praying for Paris? Are are we praying for wherever we live? Are we praying specifically, perhaps, for for neighbors? Are we praying for the world and and some of the challenges that that we face? So, So just focus on three things. What is God's will in your life? How do you pray for the greater community? And then how do you pray for the world? Let me just pray for a moment, and then I'll throw it back to you. Let's pray. And so, Father, as I think of my own life and, and I think of I'm wanting to, to love like you have loved, I'm wanting to serve as you have served, um, help me, oh Lord, to take the focus off of myself and to place it back uh, upon others. I pray for Paris, and I, I just thank you for uh, the town that we live in. I pray for the schools, uh, the teachers going back, uh, the principals, all the educators, um, the kids going back to school. May you watch over them and may you protect them. I pray for uh, the the world in which we live. I pray specifically for Malawi and the struggles and the difficulties that they face, so many people face. We see this, the the lack of peace in many countries, but Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. May you bring peace into this world. For we ask Jesus in your name. Amen. 30 seconds, have a go. Amen. Then we see Jesus goes on and says, give us today our daily bread. Again, that key word of us. 
And so I would focus upon us and, and daily, the, the, the element of what are the needs today? You know, so often we may, we may worry about things that are days or weeks or months away, but, but what are the needs today? Give us our daily bread. What are the needs of others that, that you may know? People who are, who are struggling, that, that may need to, to experience the goodness of God in their life. So, so pray specifically about the day. Let's pray. And so Jesus, as, as I think of my own life, I, I pray, Lord, that you continue to strengthen me as I'm with my family. Uh, continue to encourage me as I um, speak with others. Uh, I pray that as you bless me, that I will bless others. I pray for those in this community that are struggling today, perhaps are, are struggling with grief, a lost one, a loved one that is no longer with them. I pray for those that are struggling physically with, with hurts or with ailments. I pray for those that are struggling relationally. Um, may you encourage them. May you comfort them. May you give them your peace. Amen. You guys have a chance. Amen. The last two lines um, start to get a little personal. So I'm just going to talk about them. Um, I'm not going to pray them uh, in front of all of you. But, but the one is, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. This is at the heart of relationship. And so a lot of this for me is listening, waiting for God to speak into my life. Are there things that I have done that I need to get right with God? The things that I have failed to do or things that I need to stop doing and allow God to speak into my life and experience that incredible gift of grace, that incredible word of mercy. There's been moments, I can think back about two months ago when on a Sunday morning, um, I was getting ready to come to church and be prepared, and, and my mind was just not in a good framework. And so I, I used this as my model. I, I prayed through this, not knowing what to, needed to become revealed to me. And when I got to this part, suddenly my mind just opened, and I was reminded of the night before um, with, with Isaac and Canaan. Um, I didn't speak well to them. And they had gone to bed, and I had gone to bed frustrated and disappointed, and, and I knew in that moment that God was saying to me, you need to make this right with them. Um, and so as much as I'm sure they didn't appreciate being woken up at seven in the morning on a Sunday, I woke them up. And I just simply asked for them to forgive me because I wasn't a good dad to them the night before. And so you never know what God is gonna do when you just allow him to speak into your life. The second element is is in prayer, who do you need to forgive? And this can be so hard because people have been hurt, people have been wronged. But it's in prayer that often we begin that first step of healing and of journeying to say, how can I forgive others? And so when you're alone, just, just take those moments and, and we're just gonna quietly just maybe allow God to speak to us. I'm not gonna pray, we're just gonna pray together. And just, is there something that you need to confess to be forgiven? Or is there something, someone, that maybe God is putting before you that you need to forgive? Let's pray together. Amen. And then the final line of Jesus' prayer is, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For me, my focus is on two things. What are the things that I am struggling with in my life? What are the things that, that are preventing me from living the life that Jesus wants me to live? What are my struggles? And I just be honest about them. I think sometimes the first step in overcoming them is just being honest and open about them. The second one is the line, and, and deliver us from the evil one. What, again, what are the attacks that we are experiencing in our own life? That, that, that can pull us away from God. For, for me, I think of three things particularly right now. That of discouragement. It's so easy to be discouraged. When God wants you to do something, he'll discourage, or when the evil one will discourage you. It could be pride, about thinking it's all about me, right? That the success or the defeat of whatever I do is all about me. And consumerism, not getting caught up with the culture of the day. That, that wants to lure me in one way, but away from God. And so, let's just take a moment. Again, um, what are you struggling with? Things you either are aware of or, or, or things that maybe God wants to reveal to you. Let's pray. Amen. And so just as we conclude or include the song, I'm going to invite the musicians to come up and join me up front. But the question I'd leave with you today is, what is your next step? Whether you're someone who's a prayer warrior, whether you're someone who struggles with prayer, whether you're, you're someone who's not yet started to pray, maybe you start at a place of asking God to help you with your struggles, to help you with your questions, to help you with your difficulties because it can make a difference. And so if you, don't, if you don't have a Bible and you want a Bible and you want to have the printed copy, then take one of the blue ones in front of you, please. Um, I, I love the fact that Candace said, you know, they borrowed a Bible. Don't borrow Bibles, take Bibles. If you want another Bible, there's Bibles over there. Or if you just want to take this home with you and use it as, as, as a model to pray through this week. You know, it's not about length of time, but, but know that this week, I'll be praying for all of you in that first part of the prayer. So what's your next step? Allow faith to become real. Don't allow faith to simply be, I know I should pray. Allow it to become a conversation with him because prayer matters and prayer will make a difference in your life. Please stand with me as we conclude.